Okay, it's going. Hey, it's uh, John, uh, Bip Bop Boom, and I was inspired to make this video right now. I was watching videos, and I watched uh, Aaron's, this is a response to Aaron's uh, bologna snack um, video, and I was inspired by Vinyl Richie, his latest video with Record Store Finds, and uh, one of the records he showed inspired me, because it's one of my favorites, and, uh, oh yeah. This is a... Uh, this is a record Aaron uh, said was in his baloney stack, which is kind of like the ones you keep separate from the good records, the crap records, basically. I think this record is fantastic, and it's probably a $6 record, but to me it's worth $60. I'll explain. We'll listen to Rosetta Stone from a 1978 Irish band. He had an issue with the cat's tie. I I think they look great. You know, a little like uh, jam or whatever. But you know, this record is like uh, disco-y keyboard, like disco keyboards, rock. Uh, I'd say it's like a little glam. Not so much power pop, but like almost teen music. But this is the best version of this song, and it's stereo. It sounds so big and, and so fantastic. I love this. I say, this song alone is worth $25. The next song I'll play is also worth $25. And I say, like, at the disco and uh, a couple of the other tunes, the rest of the record, let's say it's a $10 record. So I say $60 is, what is this record's worth. You can probably find it for 6 But uh, a lot of stinkers on here, a lot of cheese. But it's real. I mean, it's kids and a producer trying to make the big time. And the inner sleeve is fantastic. But it's got the stats, like it was a teen magazine, like instruments played, what high school you go to, your favorite color, you know, your favorite food, favorite bands, favorite car. Um, but band's completely unknown besides the one fact that it features Ian Mitchell, who's who's a complete loser. I hope he doesn't watch this, but you know what? He's a complete loser, except for the fact that he was in uh, the later version of the Bay City Rollers. He was on, I don't know, this is the fourth or fifth record, I can't remember. But there he is there with the great Bay City Rollers. And I had the fortune or misfortune of uh, seeing Ian Mitchell build as the Bay City Rollers. I mean, we knew it wasn't the Bay City Rollers going in, but he, he did a little tour as the Bay City Rollers. And it's basically this one has-been drunk guy, overly drunk, just in shambles, doing a couple Bay City Rollers numbers, the, the songs he wasn't on, and then just some bad covers, like... I don't, I don't even remember what covers, but it was, it was terrible, terrible, the band was terrible, and uh, besides he wore his uh, kilt, it, it was, it was nothing to do with the bass heroes, but it was, uh, oh, we had such a great time at that show, he was terrible, but, uh, so I have a soft spot already for Ian Mitchell and the, this record, and uh, I'm going to flip it over just to play the other $25 song. And then we're going to get on to the, uh, oh, so good, so good, but, uh, we're going to talk about, uh, he showed, uh, Ronald Richie showed the Crush Butler, I guess it was reissued, uh, on, uh, for a record store day, and I didn't know that, so I would like to grab a copy of that, I think. But we're talking about Jesse Hector and all his bands and Crush Butler. And I'm going to start backwards, kind of backwards. This one's from 1998. And this is a young Jesse Hector, British guy, British bands, total London. Um, young kid, he was into Skiffle and, and stuff and bought his first record, uh, his Elvis record and jumped into rock and roll. And he did a session in, I think, 61, 1960. Never released anything, 
but it was rediscovered in 1998, and there's Jesse Hector at about 15 years old, or 16 years old, and it was put out by uh, No Hit Records, a rockabilly label, and I bought this when it came out, and this was a groundbreaking record at the time, I, I was like heavy into the rockabilly scene, and when this record came out, like to find unissued recordings and like real good ones, it's always rare, and it was always a big deal in the scene when new recordings were found, but uh, if you know a bit about rock and roll, like British studios and British sound and playing is always a bit stiffer and, and it's completely different than America where they had like any old dude, dude would put up a studio and it could sound like crap and primitive and in England it was very sterile sounding I and mean, I love that stuff but Cliff Richard and, and Marty Wilde, you know, um, the shadows, you can always hear a difference between the shadows and American instrumental groups. The rawness, out of tuneness of America. But uh, anyway, Fast Train to Memphis is the wildest rock and roll tune cut from England, cut in England at the time. And uh, it's got an echo on it, and uh, it sounds like uh, like an American rock and roll tune. It's absolutely fantastic for rockabilly. And another cool thing is uh, uh, he covers uh, All By Myself, the Fats Domino tune, but he does... Uh, He does uh, the John. Sorry, I have brain freeze. He does the Johnny Burnett Rock and Roll Trio version, which was a very rare record in England. It wasn't issued. You had to go through and buy obscure imports, just guessing, blind buys, because usually the rock and roll bands from uh, England, you know, they they would only get so many the stuff that was issued in England. So there's always like Bill Haley covers Elvis, Buddy Holly, Eddie Cochran, and Gene Vincent, and then it's always the same things. So, so to have a American obscurity or import and then do uh, then cover it is fantastic and nightmares is like a joe meek sound tune if i remember right they were gonna um record with joe meek and uh it fell through or whatever but this was shelved and uh i think etched in there it says something like uh on this side maybe but like only 37 years too late or something like that but uh fantastic record so jesse hector uh, rock and roll right from the beginning, right basically since he was a, a little kid. And he's one of the coolest guys. I, I knew him a little bit. I got to hang out with him in England. He's, he's a staple in London, so a lot of people know know him or run into him. And I don't know if it's a big deal or not, but when I met him, I got to hang out in a few hours and we just talked music. And the guy, it, it just he's seen it all. But he became a mod. And he was a, totally in the mod scene. And he would tell me about stories of seeing the pretty things and stuff. And I guess he played reportedly, it's arguably, but he played in the band The Click, kind of obscure British freak beat, not, mod band, let's say, more mod band, but, uh, and he was around, known as, as kind of a mod, but then, uh, he, he did in 69 to 71, he was in the band Crush Butler, named after, uh, Keith Moon, you know, killing the butler, crushing him with the car, um, let's see how I do this, I'm gonna switch to CD, and just play some of this absolute proto punk crush butler. And this was put out it's put out on ten inch, which I could never find. I mean maybe it's on Discogs now. It was put out on ten inch, which is always rare. I ended up getting this CD, it was reissued on RPM records. This is this is this one might be 1970. But it's, it's absolutely fantastic. Whatever Jesse Hector does is wild, over the top, very intense. He's a true rock and roller. But that was it. That crush bottle, I ended up getting uh, the, I don't know if it's a bootleg, but this other pressing of uh, Crush Bottle Uncrushed, and it's got, it's got an extra song that was on the first one which isn't on the CD, and I don't think, I think the new one from Record Store Day is missing. Uncrushed on some green vinyl. I want to say that poster. Just the cover. This is, this is absolutely wild.
in it. After Crush Butler, he formed the Hammersmith Gorillas, who were kind of semi-famous. You know, they fall into a uh, pub rock or proto-punk or even punk in a way. But they were basically mods still. Or at least Jesse said like they were still mods, but they had their own look when like long hair and then punk stuff was going on. They kept their hair long in the front, long sideburns, but shaved up in the back. And that's the uh, Hammersmith Gorillas, also known as the Gorillas. I think this is just the Gorillas. The first single was the Hammersmith Gorillas on Penny Far thing, which I don't have, which is You Really Got Me. And uh, uh, Leaving leaving Home. And that has like four different sleeves, depending on what country you got in. Like Portugal, France, England. The usual glam rock thing. Penny Farth in different sleeves. And that's the... Uh, Back Gate Crasher and uh, Gorilla Got Me. They cover You Really Got Me and then they did a instrumental kind of uh, Gorilla Got Me, which great take off of You Really Got Me. That, and what else do I have? I got uh, She's My Girl, Why Wait for Tomorrow. And you can see the absolutely nuts. This is so good. He's really one of my all time favorites. Up there with Lemmy is like true rock and roll is like to this day and then uh let's see Hammersmith Gorillas what else do I have this is a uh, reish from Monster Records probably in the uh early 2000s I don't know 1976 I, I don't know I'd say this is like not as nice as the original but still cool I think they had some other singles, the Gorillas. Just tracks that were off their, uh, this is their LP from, I think, 78. Message to the World. And no songs on the back. Yeah. Big, uh, big Hendrix fan. You saw Hendrix right, like, in the early days. Lyrics. I love the record. I want to say the, uh, Message to the World. I think it was Message to the World. One of them's got a, a track that's uh, very reminiscent of Joe Meek. I think it was the Blue Men or one of those crazy instrumentals that Joe Meek produced. But uh, after a during, I can't remember the order, but uh, this is 77. He was in a band called Helta Skelta and put out this killer, like, glam rock proto punk uh, I Need You and Goodbye Baby. And that's on the sticky label. And that was a one-off. Then in the uh, 90s, this might be 92, yes, it's 92, with the uh, Jesse Hector and the sound. Not just the catalog. He put out Leaving Town. There's, uh, there they are. Which he hooked up with a couple mods. A guy, uh... Gills I know from uh, France, who's in another band called The Click, had nothing to do. Like, in, like uh, during the 80s, 90s uh, mod scene. The early 90s mod scene more. But uh, so he hooked up with two mods and uh, and put out some killer stuff. He, he's as good as his early stuff. And then he's, uh, 1999, he put out this record. I remember buying this right when it came out. This is Jesse Hector and the Gate Crashers. I think they put out two singles. And the Gate Crashers only put out one, if I remember. And I'll put on a... a let's see. I'll, let me see. I'll put on a... This is good. This is the Crush Butler stuff. Now I'm going to... This would be uh, the Gorillas, but uh, he's really one of my favorites. He was playing like uh, I don't know what to call this, like proto punk. This, but they consider themselves like mods. Like, but they were going in the mid '70s, still doing the mods. They they felt closer to like Hendrix and the Small Faces and stuff. And a lot of the punks used to go see them because they were one of the only great rock and roll bands at the time. You know, uh, Doctor Feelgood and. You know, there wasn't that many great bands to see in the bars before the punk scene broke. 
So enough of that. Uh, then I show you some CDs we're listening to. Yeah, I showed that. Let's see. I don't remember the order of what came out. This is Big Beat '99. This is the uh, Hammersmith Gorillas, and it's got uh, not all their tracks, but it's got some of the live stuff from the very first punk festival in France, which had. Uh, uh, was Eddie and the Hot Rods might have been on that. Um, it was early, early punk festival. It was the first one. Eddie and the Hot Rods, maybe the Damned. Uh, it was more like pub rocks on it, but uh, it's a great uh, comp of all the Gorillas, Hannah Smith Gorillas. It's got the singles and some of the tracks off the album. And I just, I just love looking at them. They're just so wild. And this one, oh yeah, this was recorded at Toe Rag. Great studio. They put out some great uh, rockabilly and garage rock, modern day stuff. Uh, a lot of like Billy Childish and all the, the spin-off bands. This one's the RPM put this out, I think, uh, 2005. This is the Gorilla Ga Garage, the Jesse Hector story. And I think this is the one that's in there now. But I'm not going to go through the whole thing. I think they're all start seeing more of the same pictures. But this this is a retrospective of his whole career. And I think I have all those songs I showed. And then they put out a movie of him. I got like some advanced copy, a documentary on him. The only unfortunate thing about Jesse Hector is there's no live footage. Vintage live footage of them because they were just wild, like throwing amps, laying down, jumping around. And then a uh, message to the world came out, and it's got uh, sometime blues. I think this is all the uh, 96, 92 stuff that he did, but it's got a, a DVD, a proper DVD of the uh, of the movie, Message to the World. And that's, that's about it. But uh, Jesse Heck, oh, I'm I wearing this shirt. Sniff and Glue was an issue of uh, Sniff and Glue because it's got uh, Jesse Hector on it. Don Latz, TV Smith, the adverts, TV Smith. Yeah, the advert. This is Gorilla Got Me. But uh, maybe I'm just going to needle, I'll needle drop like one of his last, later recordings. And is this 33? Oh, great. And this will just be the last thing. I don't know. I should really get those other singles by Jesse Hector. But I, I don't know how hippie he is. I mean, that Crush Butler. So I don't know. The prices on these might be pretty reasonable. I don't know how discovered he is in America. This is like 1999. Figured this guy's been around since the 50s. The late 50s, early 60s. This would be like 38 years later. 39 years after his first recording. But what a great time hanging out with him, telling all the stories of the bands he saw in London, and the people who used to go to his shows. And that's about it. I just want—I was just inspired by Vinyl Richie because Jesse Hector's one of my all-time favorite uh, rock and roll characters. And uh, that's about it. Cheers, everybody. <laughs>